starting a business here in ways is easier and in ways is more difficult. I've been mugged and I've had things stolen and I've had moments of where people are aggressive and, and dangerous and that's normal almost everywhere in the world except here. <laughs> I've never had any even uncomfortable experience in El Salvador. We are beef back better and we're bringing beef back better in, uh, in El Salvador. <laughs> What's up guys, it's Ryan and Jessica and this is our good friend Owen. We took a little road trip with Owen and had some nice conversations about starting his business after moving here from Australia. And we wanted to share his story with you guys so we set up the camera in Tamanique and got it all on film. So let's learn about how to start a business in El Salvador. Ready to go? Let's go! Alright, let's do it. Testing, testing. Still working. I did bump this one, sorry. I'm Owen Gwilliam from Australia, but now living in El Salvador for seven months. That's only really a month ago that I started Beef Back Better, which is, um, we, we found a really good local cattle producer doing grass-fed natural beef, and we just kind of filled this, connected the dots in terms of the supply chain. So, so you can now order um, packs of grass-fed natural additive-free beef uh, that's local and that's keeping me very busy. Initially, I wasn't sure that I would be starting a beef business here because I didn't know it would be possible. And then having, I lived here for a few months and I was just asking everybody I met when I was in country areas if, if I could, if they could show me a farm or if they could, we could talk about farming and I would come across cattle and if the cattle looked good, I'd try to find the guy locally who was looking after the cattle and talk to them. And eventually, just through a few, a few steps and a few phone calls, I found a guy who was running a, a very well managed grass fed beef operation and they happened to have a processing facility on site so it wasn't so all of a sudden it, it seemed very possible and we just got started straight away. Um, so starting a business here in ways is easier and in ways is more difficult. Obviously for me the the biggest challenge is the language barrier. My Spanish is very poor so I knew I would need help with that um, and it lined up well with when I needed help, we, we basically we found this supplier and I bought the, the bits of equipment that were missing and I had some customers saying, we'll buy some, and I suddenly needed some help. And fortunately, um, I mean, even just employing somebody locally could be difficult if you don't know someone who knows someone. And so I was very fortunate that this was a friend of a friend, basically, a family member of a friend uh, who was looking for work. So and he spoke Spanish and, and English. So just as soon as I got him on board, that addressed that problem. Usually you can find someone that, that will speak English and that'll work as a, the, people are generally really helpful here and they'll want to help and they're, they're interested in what, why you're here and what you're trying to set up and they'll want to help so they can help with the translation. Um, but it is very bureaucratic. It's not some utopia here where, where things are going to be simple. It's, it's still going to be a heavy paperwork, bureaucratic process to start a company. And then there'll be monthly tax reporting and all of that junk, which I hate, um, which I wanted to escape here. But, and if you stay small, you can avoid all of that, like the coconut vendors and the farmers. None of them have companies. But as soon as you're... I, it's not clear to me exactly where the cutoff is, but as soon as you maybe got some profile or making some money, or if you're in shops that sell to retailers, then it's expected that you will have a company structure set up. So I will do that, so that to make sure that I'm complying with everything that I'm supposed to do in this jurisdiction, as much as I'd rather have nothing to do with any government in the world. But this one, at least this, it's still very, all of the government processes here are very bureaucratic still. However, the attitude, it's, at the government offices, the attitude is always really helpful, very helpful. They want, they want to help you get this thing done, whatever you're trying to do, this, this immigration approval or this, or this bank account opening or whatever. It, the government uh, and company offices here, at least they have an attitude of wanting to help you. Whereas in, certainly in other developing Latin American countries, they just want, they want you to not succeed in setting up your company or whatever you're trying to do because they want you to come back um, to pay again and they'll, they'll intentionally help you mess up your application. That, that does not happen here. They will intentionally help you do the application correctly. So generally speaking, in my experience, uh, foreigners are very welcome here. Um, 
from, from just day to day dealing with normal people. They're, they're very welcoming and helpful. If they think you need something, they'll come up and offer help. Like, do you need water? Do you need to know where the bathroom is? They will just come up and start talking to you and wanting to help you. And that extends through to dealing with companies and dealing, especially the government at the moment. Government officers now are very helpful and we're very welcome here, especially if it means if you're starting a business or something, people will just want to help and they'll say, oh, I know my brother or I have a friend who might be able to help with that. And that's a great positive attitude uh, that, that I've experienced here with, with setting up the beef business, yeah. So the setup costs for starting a business here, I mean, if you start really small and, and just start to, to test it out, you, I don't think you're going, I mean, don't take my word for it, but I don't think you're going to experience any, any trouble from government or, or anybody if you wanted to start doing some business here because everyone's doing some business here everyone's got a little racket somewhere which I love there's a you're selling coconuts or you're reselling fresh bread or you're you're selling ice cream or um, everyone is running a small business here most of them are informal and they're not paying tax and they don't have bank accounts and that's the that's the majority of the population here but everyone's an entrepreneur so you can just come here and start being an entrepreneur as well and you'll be welcome to start a company here in terms of the regulatory requirements and the reporting requirements and to make sure that you're complying with all the relevant laws, it's only going to be a few thousand dollars maximum. That's if you're engaging someone who's very professional to help. You can do it on the cheap as well for less than that, especially if you have a bit of Spanish skills. We spent a bit more time in Tamanique with Owen and had some nice conversations with a few of the locals, met some nice people. Then we climbed back into the truck and drove a little further up the road to see some of the farms where Owen told us a little bit more about what goes into a good cut of beef, how to grill a proper steak, and all about the history and challenges of the agricultural industry right here in El Salvador. Most of the beef in El Salvador is imported, so that's number one. It's uh, mostly from Nicaragua, also Honduras and the United States, the, pre the premium stuff. Um, that's number one. Number two, a lot of it is raised in ways that I don't really want to eat. So they're grain fed and they're on antibiotics and they're using hormone growth promotants and they're using a lot of... Uh, Pesticides and herbicides on the fields and all of that sort of junk and we don't use any of that, it's just grass fed and local and then the other part is that inexplicably to me, um, being from Australia where when you buy beef it's just beef, here when you buy beef it's in a plastic pack with brine, in a chemical brine solution and those chemicals include flavour enhancers and preservatives and texture agents and that's why some of the supermarket beef here actually is very tender, like impossibly tender. And those big tomahawks that are impossibly sized because they're pumped full of hormones and, and uh, double muscled like that, these huge tomahawks that people seem to like in the supermarket, are then also drenched in a chemical brine and that's how they make them so incredibly tender. But those chemicals that tenderize the meat, that does the same thing to your guts. So I don't want to eat that stuff. So our beef is local, grass fed with no synthetic products used in either in the field or during processing or during packing. Yeah so at the moment because we, we're trying to use the whole animal and we're very small so at the moment we only offer a mixed pack and we're doing a seven pound pack actually we're about to release also a premium pack and a budget pack. So we deliver for free in, anywhere in San Salvador department and La Libertad department and to other areas by arrangement if you're outside those areas just send us a message and we'll maybe we'll charge a, a small delivery fee as well to make it worth us driving down. So we've got m one main supplier now and they have quite a bit of land in their family uh, and we're but we're also looking for other suppliers but this particular farm we have they're great guys um, they, they, their farming methods are excellent. Uh, it was a miracle to find this farm. I didn't know there would be such a good cattle farm in El Salvador. Seeing how bad the beef was in the shops and seeing that it was all imported, uh, I didn't know there, there would actually be any good beef here. And I had to join the dots. I had to add a, the, the last part of the supply chain. So we have the, the vacuum packing facility and stuff like that, which I've developed. But, um, and also we're aging the beef. So we age the, the quarters go into the cool room between one and five degrees for seven days. And that's, that's what they're 
substituting when they use these chemical softeners. So instead of using the chemical texture agents, the chemical softeners, we actually age the beef for, for at least one week. So it's been great working with this local supplier. They're really happy to work with us. In fact, he had had ideas to go direct to customer with local grass-fed beef, but he hadn't sort of had the time. As, as is very common with producers, they want to focus just on the production. They might not have time to do to do marketing and, and to develop new supply chains. So uh, he's really, I mean, I haven't had to give them any advice and I wouldn't want to come across in that way. They know what they're doing. They're using rotational grazing methods. They're grass fed only. They don't use any, any pesticides, herbicides, anything already. The way they farm is already pretty good. There are a few little bits of, there are a few little tweaks that, that we've made mostly to do with the handling and the processing side. Um, but he's been, they're great to work with, they're, they're really keen to work with us and he's really proud to be, to be working with, with us and, and getting that product to, to, to local consumers that's with, with, uh, with our brand on it. He feel, takes some pride in that and um, I think there are probably a lot of producers that, uh, it's the same around the world, the producers want to focus on production. Okay, so how is the best way to cook a T-bone? Well, I'm not a chef, so and there'll be many experts in this field, but the way that I like to cook a T-bone or a ribeye is actually in a cast iron pan with a, a good amount of um, some tallow. So we also include tallow with the beef packs um, and get the pan very, very hot, basically as hot as you can. Even the tallow is at smoke point and then cook for a short period of time. Um, so it might only be a minute and a half each side and I actually use a lid as well to get it to cook through a little bit more especially if it's a thick cut so very hot short period of time okay. only turn it once or twice okay. um, the other way to cook a steak well is like very very slowly like you mm -hmm. might even smoke or slow cook ribs or something yeah. where you don't want to be is in the middle in no man's land yeah. where where the pan's not quite hot enough and you have to cook it for sort of 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's a disaster. And that's often how they cook steaks here, I've noticed, is like sort of the, the, on the charcoal, it's not hot, it's not hot, but it's not cold, and it's, and it's just uh, getting very dry and leathery in there. So uh, it is important to experiment with how you're doing, doing the, the cuts. And it seems to be very hot, just cast iron, a little bit of tallow, um, and only turning minimal time. But if you like it a little bit more well done, then add the lid. Okay, so is it ever okay to put ketchup on a steak? <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, I don't know. Do you mean tomato sauce? Is that what you mean by ketchup? Yeah. Like ketchup, ketchup. Ketchup. Like, I guess. Uh, it's not a common it? Australian word. Uh, I don't like ketchup. I generally I do have noticed that people here tend to just want to over season the steak. They'll put pepper and this and that and drench it. And then, and then they'll pour chimichurri sauce all over the thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, it, all you need is salt, in my humble opinion. <laughs> Beefbackbetter.com. So just check out the website, beefbackbetter.com. Also find me on Twitter if you like, beefbackbetter. We're also on Instagram, beefbackbettersv. Uh, and yeah, you can place an order through the website and we'll deliver the following Monday.